right, let's get at it then. So if, if you're anything like me, that music brings terror to my heart. If you grew up in the 80s, I suspect, maybe there are younger people that didn't even know what that is. Unsolved Mysteries? No? Okay. Anyway, <laughs> this first talk is entitled Who Done It? Uh, again, my name is Craig Lambert. Again, thanks for being here. So we're going to review the family and, uh, and genetic risk under storing this disease. Um, this is something I get asked about all the time. We may want to, we're going to take a look at some environmental risks and, and understand their connections to AIH and other autoimmune liver diseases as well. We're going to consider these interactions and how these genes and environment potentially can interact to contribute to either your disease onset or maybe how you respond to therapy or other things throughout the course of your illness. And finally, let's see if we can answer who done it. So autoimmune hepatitis, as many of you know, is a prototypical autoimmune liver disease. One reason that we know this is it's characterized by very strict and, and significant relationships with what's called the human leukocyte antigen. This is a gene that we'll talk a little bit about, but also significant female predominance of anywhere between 80 and 90 percent. And finally, the presence of autoantibodies. I think much of this room is familiar with the anti-smooth muscle antibody as well as the anti-neutrophil antibody. It is some interaction and culmination of some of these factors that leads to something wrong with your immune system. You are intolerant to yourself, specifically your liver. This happens in all populations. As you saw, we have age range and duration of disease. We have different ethnicities um, and really all populations around the world. We know this disease is variable and you hear me say this all the time if you follow us on social media that all AIH is not the same. This may be related to clinical presentation, so how do you present with this disease, what symptoms, and how you respond to therapy. It may even impact on, again, how you improve or get worse, hopefully not, with treatment. Now, autoimmune diseases, what do we think? Generally speaking, are autoimmune diseases going up or down in terms of prevalence or incidence? What are your thoughts? Yeah, so at least generally speaking, uh, again, at least some that we know, rheumatoid arthritis, celiac disease, uh, type 1 diabetes, we're seeing a significant increase. What do you think? Why? Overuse of antibiotics. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. Anything else? So I heard environment. Yeah, so I, I think the general hypothesis is, and this is just one, that maybe our, our genomes, our genetic material, has not adapted to the current climate of the new clean, or you could look at it, the new dirty. Um, so this kind of environmental exposures, this world that we live in is a little bit different than where it was many years ago or even 10 or 15 years ago. Autoimmune hepatitis really is not any different. We're seeing an increase in it as well. This is a study from the Netherlands. They looked at 30 different centers and on the left here you see that uh, in 2000 the, the, uh, the rate of patients per year was about 50 and over this course the average per year was about 77 patients but if you look at the trend over time we saw a significant increase. This was statistically significant and synonymous to what we were seeing in other studies regarding this disease. So in fact, AIH is increasing. Some may say, well, maybe we're diagnosing this a little bit more commonly, or at least looking for it. The big thing about genes is, and again, this must pretend to your family. And again, the next question I get is, what is my risk for my daughter, my son, my mom? This is the largest family study and probably the most important study in understanding this risk. Another Danish study that looked at 2,500 AIH patients. You guys are in the purple dots here that are patients. They looked at first degree relatives and they looked at over 8,000. That includes brothers, sisters, parents, and kids. They also looked at second degree relatives. That includes your cousins, your aunts, your uncles. They also looked at twins. I met a twin earlier, they looked at monozygotic twins, so from the same embryo, and they looked at dizygotic twins, different embryo. And so they had tremendous numbers and had a chance to look. Now, how many AIH patients did they see in first degree relatives out of 8,000? Any, any guess? This was over 10 years, by the way. Six. Six. How many second degree relatives? That's aunts, uncles, cousins. Zero. Twins are even interesting because, again, the monozygotic twins share DNA, right? So that really speaks to the idea of environment because if you have the same genes, maybe it's more than that. So how many of the monozygotic twins saw their sibling have AIH? 
one, and it dies out at zero. So it really, again, speaks to this idea that there's much more than genetics. The overall risk of developing AIH in a first degree relative over 10 years was 0.1, which means about one in a thousand chance. So if that makes you feel better for your kids and, and loved ones, I think that's important. This is a little bit different than what we see in other autoimmune liver diseases. I told you about the human leukocyte antigen. I, I don't want anybody's eyes to roll back in their head, so I'm going to try to p paint it very uh, simply. Because AI, or HLA is so important in other autoimmune diseases, you'll hear it all the time. This molecule is a protein that sits on the outside of immune cells. This is how it actually communicates with other things, other cells, the environment. It's important in communication, but also its own regulation. So this is a very simple cartoon and kind of silly, but it actually paints the picture. The invaders in the top left, they're actually degraded and brought in. These can be bacteria or other pathogens like viruses. They're broken down and then loaded into that waiter in the red shirt. That HLA is that molecule, and that waiter actually puts that molecule up on its tray, brings it to the cell surface where she's sitting up there talking to, I don't know, some, some T cell that's wondering if it should go berserk or not. Activate based on what that piece that that HLA is displaying. We know that this HLA molecule has been associated with this disease since the early 90s. And we also know that this, this problem results in the breaking of self-tolerance, meaning your body's ability to attack itself. Finally, we, we think that the patients that have this mutation or this variation have seven times the risk of AIH, so pretty substantial when you think about it. Again, this is a, what's called a Manhattan plot, and doesn't, you don't have to understand anything else but the genetics, but what's the most significant thing here? It's that peak, and that peak represents the HLA, that gene. It is most significant compared to all the other genes that are along in the blue and the, the border uh, basement. There are two variations of the HLA protein. All we have to know is O3 and O4. Those are the two that are listed. These are both associated with autoimmune hepatitis, and it, this slide really highlights that there are actually parts of this HLA that put you at risk, and there are parts that actually may be protective of this. Now, this waiter with the platter, let me show you what that platter looks like on the inside. This is looking down the barrel of the HLA molecule. So in there along that green spiral is the lip, and that's actually where that variant happens. And that's hypothesized that that variant actually determines what is loaded in that HLA. Ultimately, though, having these different variants, interestingly enough, despite increasing risk, these patients with this two different variants behave very differently. We know patients with this O3-1 have higher levels of IgG, and they actually are, are more likely to go to liver transplantation for the treatment of AIH over time. In O4, they tend to be more female, and they actually tend to develop disease at a later time in their life. So in terms of viral, or in terms of drug and viral exposures in, in the entire environment, these are really the two classic pieces that we talk about often. There are case series and, and independent reports of Epstein-Barr, herpes, CMVs, Oster, and, and all the viral hepatitis of contributing to AIH. And some of the most important and interesting things that I think, and as a part of my research, this is a study that was done actually in abstract form at the European meeting from two years ago. We see patients that are diagnosed with pediatric onset autoimmune hepatitis. On the left, 100% of them are positive or have been exposed to parvovirus. Whereas if you present, or if you compare the controls, it's a lot less. So this may be indicating that parvovirus could be an important part in some patients. The other paradigm here, just follow the red line on the left, we're looking at what's called hepatitis E exposure. The red line is the, the date of diagnosis of AIH along the y or the x-axis. On the far right, if you're more than 60 years old when you're diagnosed, you're much more likely to have ever been exposed to hepatitis E. We know pharmaceuticals, the, the main poster children for this are nitrofurantoin, known as macrobid, and minocycline. These are two common antibiotics that are still used. Um, we know that some of the work that Dr. Chalasani did in terms of drug-induced autoimmune liver disease, those important genes that we looked at were significant in AIH patients. They really weren't there when patients had drug-induced autoimmune liver disease. So it actually supports this idea that AIH with drug is really different than AIH without. 
Looking at other environmental pieces, PBC and PSC, these are other autoimmune bile duct diseases. They're kind of the sister disease to AIH, very, very different. But 50% of the cause of these diseases have been attributed to environment. They've actually seen cigarette smoking and urinary tract infections, recurrent ones, linked and associated with the development of these. AIH, we really have very little data, and, and I'm a little embarrassed to even present this data, but it's the only thing we have. Um, we, we think that the genetic underpinnings or the pieces of that environment really may be, it may be mimicking some of your own body and triggering this breaking of self-tolerance. We also may see this is why people cluster in certain areas. You've seen this in PBC, that PBC rates are higher around Superfund sites as well. In autoimmune hepatitis, the study I was talking about is we see in a small European study, antibiotic use in six months prior to development of AIH was higher in cases. We also saw people that grew up with wood-burning stoves, whatever that means. But also alcohol use in this study was somewhat protective of the development of autoimmune hepatitis. More to come on alcohol probably tomorrow. There are other environmental things, and these are just more of interest uh, than anything. Has anybody heard of chewing cat? This is an evergreen bush that's in uh, eastern Africa and southeast uh, Arabia. Uh, young men commonly chew this, uh, over 20 million users. It's associated with some significant liver toxicity, but there's actually some case series of where this chewing cat has related and caused autoimmune hepatitis. It may be more of a drug-induced autoimmune hepatitis because there's an active compound that's much like amphetamine that has triggered these. Other unusual things, there is only one study that looks at true environmental pollutants. A 2007 study, so this is old, looked at the development of AIH, PBC, and PSC in the patients that needed transplant across the country and correlated it to where patients or where people were being exposed to high levels of chlorinated hydrocarbons. These are things in like degreasers and pesticides and things of that nature. I can't comment on the scientific rigor but the red circles actually where these patients coalesce together. And we see in those sites, patients in those red rings had about 2.5 times the risk of not being out, of developing AIH and requiring liver transplant. So to highlight this gene-environment interaction, I want to be very simple. And I think everybody understands it, but think about having environmental risk and not. You have a gene, which is described here of two different variants, A and B. On the left, the disease risk. Without that environment, which is listed at the top as a negative, without that, your risk of the disease is really pretty minimal. Suddenly, you place yourself in a significant environmental risk factor, which could be many different things. But those same gene variants activate, and one suddenly, where it was not significant before, suddenly becomes very significant after that exposure. So understanding that, I think we can kind of put together a model of maybe the development of this disease on the left there, we see a number of different things and things we've talked about that are the genetic risks, but also the environmental risks that we've talked about as well. Theoretically, over time, we think these interactions gradually reduce kind of really the host tolerance or your tolerance to whatever is driving this disease. And once you hit a certain clinical threshold, inflammation may then take off, your immune system may have kind of, the horse has left the barn and results in the development of autoimmune hepatitis. Now this too, as I've said before, probably highlights why this disease is so variable. Ultimately, you know, understanding these pieces is going to be incredibly important to really target individualized therapy as well and to better understand the principles that drive it. So I will ask you again, who done it? They all did it. So that is our current understanding of this disease and I think to bring it home, I love this graphic and I think it's easy enough for patients to understand and also kind of paints the picture of what direction we're moving with research. On the left, we see the total disease risk. On the bottom, we see progressing research. We understand that that known genetic risk hopefully with time will grow and contributes to that understanding of disease risk. We hopefully will see less, we'll see more about gene-gene interactions, maybe gene-environment interactions, but also better understand the environment that we currently live in. So I'll leave you with a few things. This mosaic is what I call it, is very complex. And I, and I hate to be the one to say that very little's known, um, but that's okay. I, I think we, these, these gaps can be bridged. We do know understanding these principles will help us understand how AIH happens 
and why it is so variable among all of you. And finally, large patient numbers, we need them. We need people involved in research, and we need to be collecting concurrent environmental data as well, the best we can, which is a tremendous challenge, as you would have guessed. So if you remember the end of Unsolved Mysteries, Robert Stack would come out, and he would say, I can't do an impression, but uh, for every mystery, there is someone somewhere who knows the truth. Perhaps that someone is watching, and perhaps it's you. That's a call to action. Thank you, guys.